This is it guys, Malaysia's cheapest car, the all new 2023 Pro 2 Asia. Except that it's not exactly all that cheap anymore. In this video, we're going to cover pretty much everything you need to know about the new Asia, starting with what I think about the new elevated price range, its looks inside and out, its set of features, its engine refinement, obviously whether it still feels like you're sitting on an awesome vibration chair, and then of course how it drives, its driving dynamics, its comfort and everything. As usually, I'm going to be brutally honest in my review, especially on things that I don't like about this car. This new Asia has surprised me in a lot of ways. Now, I expect the car to be a big improvement over the old Asia, being nine years newer, but in some ways, it's even better than the Myvi. I did not expect that. But on the other hand, there are certain things where this is just as bad as the nine-year-old Asia. So yeah, certain things could definitely be improved even more than this one. So all that and more in this video, let's go. This review is powered by BH Petrol Infinity. Switch to the premium fuel today to enjoy more power and better fuel economy. First things first, this is now the second generation Asia, meaning it joins a very exclusive club among Pro Duas model ranges. This is just the third model to have the same name carried over into a new generation after the MyV and the Alza. Pro Dua says it has done so because the Asia name has become a household name here in Malaysia and rightly so. It has been monumentally popular over the years, selling over half a million units in less than 10 years. In fact, the Asia name has become a bit of a brand in itself. When you ask someone what they drive, they are more likely to say I drive an Asia instead of I drive a Perodua. That level of familiarity among the masses is something that is super hard to achieve. But having said that, I personally think that Perodua has done this car a bit of a disservice by continuing to call it the Asia because as popular as that name is, it always comes with a bit of a negative connotation. When someone says they drive an Asia, it usually comes with a bit of a downward tune. Aku bawa Asia je. Whereas when it comes to a MyV, there's a bit more pride in that. Aku bawa MyV. The Asia name is something that a lot of people associate with a car that is cheap and basic, whereas this new car is neither cheap nor is it basic. With this car, you can trace its roots way back to the original Kanchil, but with every step of the way, it has been given new names through the years to represent the big jump in terms of improvements along the years. The Kanchil turned into the Viva, the Viva turned into the Asia. This car, I do think it deserves a brand new name. Now, what do you think of this? Do you think it's good that Produa is keeping the Asia name or do you think it deserves a brand new name? Do comment below. Now let's move on to the price where I've said the Asia is no longer a cheap car. The range now starts from 38,000 ringgit and goes all the way up to just under 50,000 ringgit. But let's be honest, there are four variants to choose from, but the base Asia G is completely irrelevant to everyone. I think it's only there so Produa can say the range starts from under 40,000 ringgit. Because think about it, for just 1,400 ringgit less than the next step up, the Asia X, you lose so many things. You don't get the LED lights, you don't get keyless entry, it makes absolutely zero sense to buy the G over the X. And then as you move up the range towards the SE and the AV, it really looks as if Produa is just wanting you to move further and further up the range. By the end of it, you will be convinced to buy either the SE or the AV. And that makes the Asia a really expensive entry-level Produa from 44,000 to 50,000 ringgit. Compared to the old car, spec by spec, this is between three to 6,000 ringgit more expensive than before and while personally I do think it's well worth the new asking prices it's 6,000 ringgit better than the old car but to people who just want a car to run around in to just drive around in that 
is irrelevant to them. They just want a cheap car. This is no longer cheap anymore. That is also another reason why I think had Prodo given this car a brand new, different name, the price hikes will be a bit easier to swallow for most people. As it is the same name, the same Asia name, but why does it cost 15% more expensive? With the new Asia's elevated price range, Prodo now has a very compressed model range with a lot of overlap as well. Just think about it, for the same price as this Asia AV, you can also get the Beza AV, which as a sedan, a lot of people see as an upgrade over a small hatchback like this. And then you've got the MyV as well, at just over 1000 ringgit more than this, you can get a 1.5 litre my V. That is clearly a bigger car with a much bigger engine as well. So yeah, looking at the Asia in itself is a bit of a tough ask. But on the other hand, the new Asia is superior to the MyV in a lot of ways. For one, it's built on the latest DNGA platform, the same one used in the Ativa and Alza. The MyV G3, if you remember, was built off a modified skeleton, modified bones of the second generation MyV. And that is now around 15 years old compared to this, which is brand new. And it's also shared with the new Toyota Vios. That's bragging rights right there. So the fact of the matter is the new Asia is really built from the ground up as a much more modern machine using far more advanced materials and technology to the point that Prodo just cannot build and sell them at the same prices as before. Now, I genuinely believe that in terms of value, you do get a lot more car for your money. You get a better deal with the new car compared to the old car. But the sad reality is a lot of people are not going to be able to afford an Asia at 50,000 ringgit. A truly affordable Perodua, a Perodua Rahma, a Perodua Rakyat Marhen, if you will, no longer exists, unfortunately. But enough of that, let's talk about the car itself. The second generation Asia is significantly bigger than the car it replaces, which is clear to see just by looking at the car itself. This is a much more substantial car as a whole. It looks far more expensive than the old one. In terms of measurement, this is around 130 millimeters longer than before, and the wheelbase has been stretched by 70 millimeters. It's to a point where the Asia now has a longer wheelbase compared to the bigger MyV. In terms of styling, the second generation Asia is a big step forward for Prodoa's entry level model, especially at the front here. Prodoa has claimed to have taken the lead in designing the car from the ground up, and the proof of that is that the Daihatsu Ayla for the Indonesian market looks exactly the same as this. Previously, all the shared models between Prodoa and Daihatsu, the Ativa and the Rocky, the Alza and the Xenia, even the old Asia and the Ayla had unique different faces. And now it's Daihatsu's turn to use the same face as Prodoa, not the other way around. Prodoa is slowly climbing up the ranks within the wider Toyota group and that's something we can all be proud of. But of course, Toyota's own version of this car, the new Agya, looks even better so we are still getting the somewhat downgraded looks here in Malaysia. Another piece of bad news is, while well, you can do a simple bumper swap to convert your Ativa into a Rocky, the Agya has got different set of headlights and bumpers as well. So while technically you can convert this into an Agya GR Sport, it's going to be very expensive, way more than what you should be spending on an Asia anyway. Now let's talk about the details. The headlights are relatively big for this small face and they protrude out a lot from the front bumper over here. If you look closely, there is a nice line of LED lights that sort of joins into the front chrome line. But that unfortunately is just the LED positioning lamps. The daytime running lights are actually down there. Now I think it would have looked a lot better had the DRLs been embedded within the headlights themselves but clearly this has been done in terms of cost saving measures. Now with this setup, Prodoa can install the same lights for models with and without DRLs so it's cheaper on their end. There's another benefit for customers buying the cheaper models without DRLs also because you can now install aftermarket lights down there much easier, much more cheaply as well. The bumper itself has this really aggressive X-shaped element much more prominently than in the Ativa and the Alza. And this piece over here, I think if you just do a simple black wrap on it, you'll end up with a bit of a budget Lexus spindle grille look to it. That's going to be quite interesting, I think. Overall, I do think the new Asia looks fairly attractive from the front, if perhaps not so from the back. Although not all Asias look the same as this. 
if you buy the base Asia G, this full LED headlights will be swapped out for a really ugly looking reflector halogen headlights. That's one of the reasons I think you should just avoid the G altogether. And at the bottom, these black garnish pieces are only on the SE and the AV variants. Moving on to the side, the Asia has a bit of an awkward shape because the whole front end looks as if it's been chopped off. What you end up with is a really flat front end. Just as controversial is the wheels because it doesn't matter which Asia variant you choose, whether the base G or the top of the range AV, you get the exact same 14 inch alloy design, which to me just looks completely off. Now, 14s look fine on the old Asia, but this being a much bigger car with much more pronounced wheel arches, they just look lost. Even if Produa insists on having the same wheels for all cars in the name of efficiency, the least they could have done is give the AV wheels a bit of a two-tone look or maybe a machine finish, at least to make it look a bit more different, a bit more unique. Right now, it just looks a bit lame. Putting on bigger wheels will most definitely affect this car's performance and fuel efficiency. But I think that is a sacrifice that a lot of consumers are willing to make for better looks, I think. Honda Malaysia has already proven this with its Civic range. The top of the range RS has got bigger wheels, slower performance, higher fuel consumption, but people are more than happy to pay extra for the better looks. On a positive note, at least the tyres have been given a big upgrade. Now, all Asias get the same Toyo Proxxas CR1 tyres, which are pretty good, pretty decent in my books. Moving on, this car does share a lot of similar parts with other DNGA products such as the Ativa and the Alza. So you've got the same wing mirrors over here which look quite good. Although if you buy the cheapest Asia G or X, the side signal repeaters are moved down here on the front fender. That looks really old school and cheap. Another shared DNGA part are the door handles. So even the Asia now has the far more advanced electrostatic touch sensor for the keyless entry system. Instead of the traditional button type on the old Asia, as well as the current Myvi and Arus. Although this being a Produa, you still have a single sensor on the driver's door and none on the passenger side. Moving on to the back, the C pillar of this car has been given a bit of an angle, making it look closer to the Myvi rather than the straight cut old Asia. This itself goes a long way in making this car look far more modern than before. Another modern touch is the fact that this was designed from the ground up to have a dual tone paint job at some point in its life. You can see the clear channels on the rear pillars as well as the base of the front A pillars where the black roof would start. You just know at some point there is going to be a special edition Asia with a dual tone color. And in fact, in Indonesia, you can already buy a Toyota Agya with a dual tone color, which I think look pretty good. The back end is easily the least successful part of this car's redesign. After the very striking front end and the side, the back end is a bit of a disappointment. I'm just not a big fan at all. There's just something about the way the lights looking a bit too small, a bit too boxy and off to the side. Well, the rest of it looks a bit too plain, I think. People on the net have been saying that this car looks a bit like the Volkswagen Polos or the BMW 1 Series, but for me, I think it reminds me more of a much older Toyota Vitz or Yaris. It doesn't help at all that the taillights have been given a downgrade as well. The old Asia had LED taillights, but these have moved back to halogen bulbs instead. To compensate for that, Prodo has changed the third brake light to faster reacting LEDs instead of old bulbs, but yeah, any sort of downgrade is just not a good thing. Moving further down, you've also got this rather weird and awkward line going from edge to edge. Sort of looks as if the car's already been crashed into, I think. Having said that, all three models, including the Toyota, Daihatsu and Prodo, have got the exact same rear bumper, same rear styling. So yeah, I guess it's not just the Prodo being hit by an ugly stick over here. And in fact, among the three models, the Daihatsu looks way worse than this. The differences between variants are very minor. The top spec SE and the AV get this really small top spoiler extension, while the bottom garnish around the number plate get this black finish instead of plain body colour. But other than that, the car looks practically identical from top to bottom. For now, there are no gear up body kit available for the Asia just yet. So hopefully that will come in a bit later to improve the looks a little bit. While the Asia has a bit of a hit and miss design on the outside, in here, it's absolutely fantastic. I'll be honest, the first time I saw the Asia, I was a bit unsure about the exterior, but once I stepped inside, sold completely. This is such a fantastic interior 
for a cheap car. Now I know it's not a cheap car anymore, but all you have to do is compare this interior against the old Asia's dashboard and you'll know why this is the more expensive vehicle. This does not look or feel in any way like a cheap car anymore and if anything, I think this is a much nicer cabin than in the MyV. You will not find any better interior for 50,000 ringgit. I can guarantee you that. In terms of design, it's clean, simple, yet attractive. You've got this long silver strip running across the center, makes it feel wider than it actually is. And then it does feel different enough compared to the Ativa and the Alza while keeping the same family look overall. I think before this, Prodo has sort of struggled to keep a consistent family look, especially on the inside. Think about it, the older Alza, the Myvi, the Viva, they all look completely different on the inside. Now, finally you have a family look and it's definitely the right way forward I think. But in terms of build quality, this car is just about okay. If anything, in terms of fit and finish, I think the old car felt a little bit more consistent than this. This one you can just move things about and the center console over here, yeah, it really moves when you put any pressure on it. It doesn't quite feel as sturdy as the old car. And then you've got this small airbag cover as well. It's of a completely different color to the dashboard and you can really see the outline on it. Yeah, not the best look. But to say that this car feels cheap on the inside would be really unfair because me personally, I think this feels expensive. This shares a lot of premium features with the rest of the DNGA Pro Dua models. The meters is the exact same 7-inch digital screen you'd find in the Ativa and the Alza and it's fully customizable with multiple design themes as well. Each design has its own unique startup animation and while this looked impressive in the 70,000 ringgit Alza and Ativa, here on the 50k Asia, it's even more mind-blowing. And then you've got the 9-inch center touchscreen over here, exact same one you'd find in the Ativa. This is much bigger, much nicer to use than the one in the MyV. Now, of course, this isn't quite the top of the range Apple CarPlay system like in the Alza, but of course, this is Pro Dua's cheapest car. They have to have some sort of product differentiation between the models, of course. Down here is the full digital aircon controls first introduced in the MyV together with the memory 1 and 2 functions perfect for Malaysian weather. In terms of design, I think this fits the rest of the cabin far better than in the Ativa and the Alza as well. Although in the Alza here, there is one small missing button that is meant for the rear dimister, but the Alza doesn't have it. Doesn't matter which variant you choose, the rear screen is just completely clear with no horizontal lines on them. Now, Pro Dua says nobody used them to begin with, so they took them out, but a bit kosong, right? Other than that, this car also shares the exact same steering wheel and gear lever as the far more expensive DNGA products. So overall, this feels nowhere near as cheap as the old Asia did. Back then, if you jump into an Asia and then you jump into a MyV, that is a big step up. Right now, this Asia, yeah, perhaps even better than a MyV. It also helps that for the very first time, Prodoa's entry-level model has a tilt-adjustable steering wheel. This makes it far easier for drivers of any size of any height to find the ideal driving position. The angle of the steering wheel itself is far more car-like than before. The old Asia had a wheel that is angled something like that, a bit like a van, like a commercial vehicle to drive, and this is just far more comfortable all day long. And then you've got the seats themselves which are absolutely perfect. They look very good, they hug you in all the right places and they're just so comfortable, so supportive. I've driven this car for a few hours on end and I never felt tired at all. Now that's the very first time I can say that on any Pro Dua I've driven. But of course, it's not all perfect. This car may be brand new for 2023, but it doesn't have a single USB charging port for your phone. I mean, there is one USB plug over here. That's really more to power a thumb drive than a phone. Who even uses thumb drives anymore in 2023? So unfortunately, to charge your phone, you still have to buy one of those old school 12 volt charger adapters and plug it down there. Yeah, not very modern, is it? And then you've got this rear view mirror. Now I know I rarely ever talk about rear view mirrors unless it's one of those fancy digital screens. But over here, I'll give it an exception because this is one of the very first cars that I've driven that makes me dizzy whenever I look into the rear view mirror. When I drive along, there's just something about that mirror yeah, makes me not want to look into it at all. 
The mirror itself has a bit of a fish eye effect that distorts the image way too much for my liking. Me, I just cannot stand looking at it at all. The next thing is something that you can't actually see because this of course is the top of the range ASIA AV with all the bells and whistles. If you choose any of the lower, cheaper variants, you just lose out on too many things that make this car such a good buy to begin with. If you buy the G or the X, you don't even get a ref counter and you get a manual aircon controls instead. If you buy the base G, you even miss out on a few things that I probably think cost about 50 cents at most one ringgit to make like rear grab handles, center cup holders, why even make an option without it? And then the safety, the headlight is you can now get 6 airbags as well as an upgraded ASA 3.0 in an ASIA. But the catch is, that's only available on the AV version. You buy anything else, you get none of the ASA features and only 2 airbags. I would have thought they would have followed the MyV by having at least 4 airbags for the bottom variants. As for the rear seats, surprisingly, despite this car being a much bigger car on the outside compared to the old version, inside here, it's just about the same as before. Legroom is just fine, if anything, it's perhaps a bit more than the old car because of the scallop shape of the front seat, although the headroom is a bit limited. For your reference, I am only 167cm tall, but even then, sitting up straight, my hair is just almost reaching the ceiling over here. I think if the car hits any bump, yeah there goes my hair. So if you're especially tall, you're not going to fit in the back here all that comfortably. Now, the one thing they have improved for the ASIA is the width of the rear seat. It is about 40 millimeters or 4 centimeters wider than before, so you can just about fit three adults in the back here a bit more comfortably than before. It's still not ideal because overall this is still a very narrow car, but definitely better than old car. And then you've got the rear bench. The base is still a little bit short and the backrest still too upright, still too short. So yeah, for longer journeys, it's not quite the best fit. You still have the usual pro dual features, the tetare hooks behind the front seats, both left and right. You still have the empty snatch handbag hook right down the middle here. Although I'm just not sure how many people actually use this feature still. And a very small cup holder down the center. Other than that, yeah, that's pretty much it really. One last thing before we drive, the boot. The old car had a traditional release lever for the boot. We now have an electronic button release instead. Now, which you can hear right here. A lot of people will call this as one extra thing that will go wrong. But me, I just call it progress. Now, this opens up to what appears to be a much bigger boot space. But according to Produa, this is only 5 litres bigger than the old car. But just by looking at it, you know this is a much more practical boot. It's just deeper, much wider than before. You can easily fit more things in it than in the old car. What they haven't improved is the folding rear seat because this is still a single piece backrest. Now in the MyV, that car has got a 60-40 split folding feature. So even if you have to put in a big item, you can just fold one side down and still seat one or two people in the back. With this car, as soon as you fold the rear seats down, this car becomes a strict two-seater. What's worse is that folding the rear seats takes a lot of effort. You really have to release the hangers of the tonneau covers first which is not an easy task, I might add, and then reach with both arms to each corner to fold the seats down. Yeah, not easy. There has to be a better way to do this. Having done that, what you end up with is a bay that is hardly flat and worse still, the seats lay down at a bit more of an angle compared to the old car. Well, anyway, let's move on to the driving, finally. Alright, finally we're driving the 2023 all-new Perodua Asia. Just like the original Asia, there is just a single engine available. But exactly like the old car, it's the same engine. This is a 1.0-litre, 3-cylinder, naturally aspirated engine. The exact same 1KR VE from before. So that is a bit of a disappointment. So even though this is 9 years newer than the old car, you get the exact same engine outputs. 67 horsepower and 91 newton meters of torque. So yeah, that's not going to excite anyone. It's <laughs> both uh, two figures which, you know, yeah, sounds very, very little, and I suppose they are. But remember, this is a small and light car, so performance really isn't 
that big of an issue. It's just that you know, in nine years, you would expect to be some sort of development, some sort of improvement. But yeah, we get none, absolutely none at all. Even in our neighboring markets, Indonesia, this car's twin brothers, the Toyota Agya and Daihatsu Ayla, they get a brand new engine, a 1.2 liter three cylinder engine. And that's from an all new different engine family, the WAVE. So that is clearly a much more advanced design, far more efficient than all that. And it gets a bit more power as well, at least, you know, over hundred Newton meters of torque. But here, yeah, we get the exact same one, a bit of a pity, I think. What is new to the Asia is of course the transmission. While in the old car, you got an option between a four-speed automatic and a five-speed manual gearbox. Here, you just get a single option, a DCVT, a dual mode CVT. Now the manual Asia will live on, but as an upgraded version of the original first generation Asia, that's gonna be launched slightly later on. If you want the second gen Asia like this, you only get an option of a D CVT. But before we get to all the performance bits, let's talk about the refinement first because that has been one of the bigger complaints, the bigger downfalls of the original Asia. The three cylinder engine was notorious, was very, well, I'd say famous or infamous for being very rattly. You drive that car, you feel like you're seated in an OSIM chair that's how much it vibrated. The entire dashboard would shake as well, sometimes a little bit excessively so. This new Asia, however, despite having the exact same engine, feels nothing like that. This feels far more refined than the original Asia. I know it's gonna be hard to believe because it is the exact same engine as I've said, but driving it around, it really is such a massive improvement. Even at idle, you no longer feel that constant vibration the old car had. There is still a little bit of that thrum, that little bit of that roughness from a three-cylinder engine because it is still an inherently imbalanced engine design, but it's very, very minimal. So even at idle, even sitting in a traffic jam, you hardly feel that much of a vibration. And then as soon as you start moving, there's practically nothing of that at all. This is, like I said, night and day difference compared to the old Asia in terms of refinement. The noise, however, yeah. 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 It's still there. It's a little bit more hushed, of course. It's a little bit more refined, but you still hear a lot of that very rough and gruff three-cylinder engine. It still feels, it still sounds like a cheap engine. So that part, like I said, a bit of a disappointment. I would have much preferred to see a new design 1.2 liter engine instead. But having said that, refinement as a whole is a whole lot better than the old car. We've actually measured this using a dB meter, using the old car as a reference compared to the new car. The new one is just a lot quieter, whether you're going at idle, whether you're going at 60 or 110. The difference, this is always around three to four, up to five decibels quieter than the old car. And before you even say that the old car was a, you know, old, tired junk that we found. It was actually a very good one with fresh engine mountings and transmission mountings installed. So I think that was a bit of a fair comparison, the old and the new. And the new one absolutely shined in that one. It's quieter, there's a lot less vibration, so it's an improvement all around. But now let's talk about performance because in terms of the driving feel of the engine, it feels about the same. We actually did a very short drag race between the new and the old car and up to about you know, 100, 200 meters, they were neck and neck. We couldn't see any difference. Now, of course, the new Asia has a bit of an advantage, a very small advantage in terms of response time. And that is mostly from the gearbox because of course the engine is again the same. So say you're cruising at 60 for both cars and then you plant your foot down for a quick overtake, the new car will just shoot off slightly faster than the old car. We've timed it and this car goes from absolute zero to 100 kilometers per hour in about 15 seconds, that is a long time, but the old car took about 17 seconds. So it's a bit faster. It's not fast by any means, but it's slightly faster than the old car. This, of course, by no means is a performance car. So you have to keep your expectations in check a little bit. 
But this car feels a lot nicer if you drive it like you own it, like you drive it like an everyday car instead of, you know, full throttle like a maniac everywhere. So this is a very important point. If you're going for a showroom test drive of this car, try to drive it like you would normally drive your own personal car, not like, you know, somebody else's car. Most people that I see going on showroom test drives, as soon as they see a bit of an open road, they'll just plant the foot down and then, you know, give a few silly comments like, engineer, bunyi kuat eh? I mean, you're going full throttle, of course you're gonna hear the engine. But you drive it like a normal person, like a sane person, like you've paid your own cents, your own ringgit for the car. And, you know, it's fairly quiet, it's fairly refined. Now let's talk about the transmission, which is also a massive leap forward for the ASIA. Me, I've got nothing against four-speed automatics. Yes, they are by now ancient technology, they are much better, much newer systems by now, but a good 480 is better any day compared to a bad CVT. Like if you take any of the early Proton Punch CVTs compared against the one of the more recent Produa 480s, I would choose the 480 any day of the week. But thankfully, this new DCVT is a very good one. It is by far and away a better option compared to the old 480. In terms of outright performance, it feels just about the same as I've mentioned, but in terms of the response, the reactiveness, it is far superior. Like I said, I'm going at 80, quick full throttle, and the revs rise really, really fast, and the car just surges forward much faster, much quicker in terms of response compared to the old car. There is no big jerk in terms of physical downshift like in the old car as well. In the old car, you know, you're cruising on fourth gear, suddenly you give it a bit of a boot and it jumps down to third, there is a bit of a kick on your back as it does it. This one, it's super smooth. But having said that, in terms of smoothness, I wouldn't give this car perfect points either because at lower speed, say between 20 to 30, there is a bit of a roughness to this car. There's a bit of a jerking motion where this car sort of gets into gear. It's the same feeling that I get in the latest Myvi and even the Artiva as well. So if you've driven one of those, you feel a little bit of that jerkiness that is still there in this one. It's perhaps a little bit less noticeable or rather you wouldn't fault it as much because you know this is in Asia so you don't have such high expectations for it but even then that is still there. It's smoother than an old 480 for sure definitely better in, in pretty much every sense but yeah I wouldn't give it perfect marks either. Now one portion of the powertrain that is 100% optimized is the fuel consumption of this car. Now I know Produa claims this car can do up to 27 kilometers per liter here. It doesn't do that nowhere close but in my own driving experience after having driven it over 300 kilometers I've averaged between 19 to 20 kilometers per liter without even trying. That to me is absolutely fantastic. At the current price of Ron 95, 2 ringgit and 5 cents per litre, that works out to just over 10 cents per kilometre. Doesn't get any cheaper than that. This is also why I think Produa is a little bit reluctant to introduce any sort of hybrid technology because its current cars, even with the current technology, is already super efficient to begin with. So adding on far more expensive, far more complicated hybrid tech might not bring that big of a jump, that big of a benefit to its customers. Think about it, 20 kilometers per litre on a day-to-day -day drive because I've driven through a lot of traffic jams, a lot of highway driving, a lot of uphill driving as well and even then I've averaged 20 so if you do most of your driving on the highways you will likely reach 22, 23 somewhere there and that is insanely efficient I think. This also has a slightly bigger fuel tank than before, a 36 litre tank over 33. So theoretically, you can reach around 600, maybe even 700 kilometers before having to refuel again. On such a small car like this, that is amazing. The fuel economy tests were carried out with BH Petrol Infinity, the fully imported premium fuel with maximum German additives for peak performance to give you more power, mileage and more savings. 
Okay, Crodoa does have different sets of claims for the lower two variants, the X and the G, compared to the top two variants, the SE and the AV. Now that is solely because of the eco idle feature, where if the car comes to a complete stop, like say a traffic light or even a standstill traffic jam, the engine will shut off when you come to a stop. So of course, when it's off, it doesn't use any fuel, saving you up to 10 to 15% overall in terms of fuel consumption but of course if you do mostly highway miles open road driving that difference is practically zero and even if you do come to traffic jams most pro drivers i know turn this system completely off so again don't think that extra 10 15 percent is going to be that big of a benefit to you because more likely than not you are going to turn this system off me i find myself turning it off most of the time because it's still very very annoying it's less annoying than the old car because every time it starts back up again there's a little bit less of that vibration but the sound is still really really annoying let's just show you right now as i come to a stop the engine will shut off right there now that is completely fine, my problem is as soon as you lift off the brakes, the engine will start back up and the ignition sound is still too loud. Hear that? Yeah, I'm not a fan of that at all. Now like I said, the vibration is a lot less than the old car. In the old car, every time you lift off the brakes, you hear a bit more of that sound and you feel it as well. Now it's more just hearing rather than feeling, but I would still rather just turn the system off. Now let's move on to more positive things, how the new Asia drives. Now let's talk about handling first because there is a big jump in terms of driving feel with this car. The old car really felt very light, very floaty if you're going on a highway. I think in the old car, if you're approaching say 100 km per hour or even slightly above it, there is a bit of that unnerving feel that you get when you're driving and you feel like you're not 100% in control. The steering wheel gets a little bit light. You feel like you're sort of floating or moving between lanes a little bit so you have to do a lot of minor steering corrections in that car. With this one, that is 100% remedy, that is 100% solved. This feels far more stable than the old car. If you drive it on the highway, keep it to the middle of the lane, yeah, that's where it will track. This, this feels far nicer to drive on the highways, even at higher speeds, I think. I actually did a back-to-back -back test between the new and the old Asia, and in simple terms, the old car, when cruising at 80 km per hour, that felt a little bit less safe, a little bit less stable than the new one does at 110 km per hour. That's how big the difference is. So this gives you just so much more confidence, so much more reassurance that you can just go on highway, drive as fast as you want, 110, 120 even, and it will just stick. It will be as stable as you want a modern car to be. If anything, this feels even more stable than the bigger MyV. I know that's hard to believe, but trust me on this, this is nicer to drive than a MyV. And this translates well into the ride quality as well because yeah, somehow the new Asia rides better than the MyV as well. This is still a very small and very light car, but it does have that big car ride quality. Going through major bumps, this car absorbs everything really, really well. Like it's a much more expensive, much more substantial car. On the outside, I am 100% impressed by this car suspension. I know the new Ativa has a decent ride, the brand new Alza has a good ride as well, but this is the one that surprises me the most. I think it's more to do with how jiggly, how cheap the old Alza felt. So this feels like an even bigger jump than even the old Alza into the current Alza. Even for handling is not bad either. This is still a very light car. It feels very nimble as you string it through corners. There's minimal body roll, I would say. Although I wouldn't call it a fun car to drive. I think you need to change the suspension, tune a little bit here and there to make it a fun daily driver. As it is, it's a very competent one and there's nothing wrong with that. 
Now the one thing that I think should have been improved further is the refinement or rather the road noise and wind noise of this car. I'm only doing 95 kilometers per hour here in Putrajaya and yeah, all you hear is a lot of road noise, a lot of wind noise. I'm not even going that fast. So in this sense, this still feels like a cheap budget car. There is no escaping that. That's pretty much the only valid complaint that I can throw at this car as you drive along. Going on a highway, say 110 km per hour, you do get too much of that tire noise and wind noise coming in and then you know you really can't drown it out with the sound system either because even though this has the upgraded six speaker setup, it doesn't sound very good. Now, lastly, before I give my final verdict, let's talk about the ASA 3.0 system that we have over here. This is Produa's very latest advanced safety assist systems and it works very well. This includes autonomous emergency braking, which to me is the bare minimum that you would need to have when you're considering to buy a brand new car in 2023. So unfortunately, you do have to spring for the top of the range ASEA AV to get this feature. Now the old ASEA AV also had AEB as standard as part of the ASA 2.0 system, but the new version now operates over a wider range of speeds so it is quite a fair bit safer in that sense. The new ASEA also adds on a few things that the old car didn't have such as blind spot monitor which is really important. You wouldn't know how much you would rely on this feature until you get used to it. And then this car also has something called rear cross traffic alert which up to a few years ago was only ever reserved for the top of the range expensive premium cars and now the ASEA has it as well which is fantastic. Now with this feature, let's say you're driving out of a parking lot, you know you've got cars blocking both your left and your right so you can't really see if there's any cars coming. Now this will sense if there's a bike or a car coming out of your view and it will give you a warning if there is one. So that is an absolutely crucial safety tech as well. Another upgrade is the inclusion of lane departure warning and lane departure prevention. Now this works primarily in my opinion as a way to force you to use your turn signals which obviously you need to. If you don't indicate and you try to change lanes, you will get a warning buzzer from the car. So after a while of driving this car, you'll end up using your signals more often, which is definitely a good thing in my books. Now lane departure prevention is a bit more interesting. Now if the car detects that you are swerving into a solid line rather than a dotted line like lanes, it will give a bit of a tug on the steering wheel to get you back into lane. Now, I've tried this and it feels a little bit unnatural, a little bit unnerving, but when it really works, it can really save a life, I think. This is a very important safety feature that is good to have moving forward. One thing the ASEA does not have is the adaptive cruise control and level 2 semi-autonomous driving features that the more expensive models have, like the Myvi, Alza, Ativa and so on. I mean, this car doesn't even have basic cruise control, but yeah, that's to me not such a bad thing. It's one of those things that's nice to have, but on a car like ASEA, I think that is fine to not have. Other than that, of course, the jump to having six airbags is already a big advantage there. Although, again, it's a bit of a pity that Produa has reserved that only for the top of the range AV. So if you are looking at the lower end of the market, the, even the SE, you are very much compromised when it comes to safety. That is a bit of a sticking point, I think. So that's my full review of the all-new 2023 Produa ASEA. Now this to me is such a big step forward for Produa's entry-level model. If you are old enough to remember how big of a jump the old Viva was compared to the original Kanchil, and then how much better the ASEA was over the Viva, this one over here represents an even bigger step forward for the model. That's how good the new ASEA is. Yes, it is a lot more expensive to buy than before, which is a big shame, but even at these new prices, in terms of value, it's the best one 
in Perodua's range yet. I think if you were to give consumers a choice whether to buy the old RZI at the old prices or the new improved version at the new prices, most people will be gladly paying for the new version. For that extra 10 to 15%, this is now a much bigger car with a nicer interior and much better features. But even more significant than that is the way this car drives. The ride is generally better than that of a Myvi, and despite this having the exact same engine as before, it's far more refined than the old Asia. There's not too much vibration going on and the new DCVT just give it a lot better performance than before. And then you've got the unbeatable fuel consumption figure of 20 km per litre, that's just amazing. But having said that, there are still a lot of faults. It's still far too loud at highway speeds with too much wind noise and tyre noise in the cabin. And while the performance is okay, I would have much preferred having the newer 1.2 litre engine that Indonesia gets. The worst of all is in terms of safety. Prodoa's decision of reserving all the extra bits into the AV is a step in the wrong direction, I think. In 2023, I would say that active safety features is the absolute bare minimum you should have on any new car on sale today. And the fact that prices have gone up across the range, I expected ASA to be fitted right down from the ASEA G, not just for the ASEA AV. So if you were to ask me overall, is the new ASEA any good? The answer is very, very simple. It is an excellent car through and through. But I have to say the lower end of the market, the ASEA X and the ASEA G and the SE, could do with a big bump in terms of safety features. But rest assured, if you're looking for the AV, you are getting the absolute best car that money can buy for 50,000 ringgit. So that's my full review of the new ASEA. Do let me know what you think of the car and my review in the comment section below. For now, thank you for watching and stay safe everyone. This review is powered by BH Petrol Infinity. Switch to the premium fuel today to enjoy more power and better fuel economy.